Good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets and this month's non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday the 6th of October. My name is Michael Hewson and I will be taking you through the numbers and uh, and obviously the disclaimers as well. I was scheduled to be joined by me, my colleague in Toronto, Colin Szynski. Unfortunately, he's uh, he's no longer available um, uh, to to attend and help me out with respect to uh, this webinar. So you'll just have the pleasure of my company. Please feel free at any time to ask me questions over the chat facility. Just um, just reply to the message. That I've um, that I've just uh, just sent over. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that uh, you might have, and hopefully, hopefully, I will be able to answer them. And hopefully, this month's payrolls number will be um, less eventful than the number last month, where CNBC um, broadcast a number which was complete nonsense, and ultimately prompted a little bit of a counter move in the U.S. dollar after uh, the number, the actual official numbers came out. So what are we expecting today? Well ultimately we're expecting a number that's going to be very much storm affected by Hurricanes Irma and Harvey. And that means essentially that the headline payrolls number is probably not as important as it would be in months previously. And we've already seen earlier this week with the ADP payrolls report that the employment numbers were affected by the um, by the by the by the tropical storms and the hurricanes came in um, significantly below expectations at around about 137 but there hasn't really been that much of what I would call a correlation between non farms and ADP numbers in recent months we've seen a significant divergence between the numbers so I think even if we get a disappointing number for non farms today and we are expecting a disappointing one of well below 100,000 and certainly the lowest number for the year. So the consensus view is for uh, job gains of around about 80 or 90,000 but even if we come in well below that we can generally put that down to the fact that the, the, the transatlantic storms have skewed the number to the downside in a similar way that we saw with the ADP numbers. What we have seen this week is some very positive ISM data, manufacturing and services. And what's particularly um, confidence boosting about those particular numbers is that the internals were also very, very positive. And as a result of that, we've seen a significant move higher in the dollar index. And we can see that on this chart here. This is the dollar index. And we've been in a downtrend pretty much since the first Fed rate rise in December at the end of last year. Every single rate rise we've seen a lower dollar. Now we are seeing a little bit of a rebound at the moment. And as you can see from the horizontal line that I've drawn on on this particular chart, um, I really don't see that um, we're going to see a significant move higher in the dollar because an awful lot of what I would say is a positive dollar move is already priced in. And what we've got here is what I would call an inverse head and shoulders. And it's it's matched pretty much by a I'm pretty you know it's matched pretty much in a mirror image by Euro dollar, where there's a significant area of support around about 11670. Now this is this is the left shoulder here. We've got a head here and we've got a fairly weak right shoulder here. So I think short of a move above 9420 on the dollar index. I think unless this is a really gangbusters positive dollar number, I think by and large a decent a decent number is already priced in, and it, and, and a bad number is probably going to have a little bit of a, a little bit a little bit of a case of dollar weakness. Certainly, if we look at the weekly chart, we can see that over the past four weeks we've seen four successive weeks of dollar gains. So, I think for me, you're going to have to have a very very positive wages number. Um, to really suggest that we can get, we have the potential for further dollar upside. So I think for, for what, what I'm looking for this week, it's less about the headline payrolls number and it's more about the wages number. But ultimately, I think with respect to the dollar move that we've seen this week, I think we've probably seen it. Um, and I'm being asked if you can view the dollar index on the platform. You can. 
it's down here, but unfortunately we don't have an awful lot of historical data, which is essentially why I've used the Bloomberg chart, because it gives me a much longer frame of reference when it comes to actually looking at the dollar index as a whole on a historical basis. Um, what we, can, we, we can only see the, the actual um, futures contract, you can't actually see the cash contract, and that's why I generally tend to look at the dollar index uh, on the Bloomberg chart because it gives me a much better long-term history of where the actual numbers are. We've also got the Canadian payrolls report as well and certainly the Canadian economy has been going very very well over the course of the past few months. GDP growth of annualized around about 3% a year. We've seen two rate hikes from the Bank of Canada and there is speculation that we might actually see another one over the course of the next few months. So I think in terms of the US and North American economic data, it's been a fairly positive outlook. Um, so we've got the numbers up here, expecting an unchanged unemployment rate of around about 4.4% for the US economy. Um, average earnings on a month-on-month -month basis of 0.3, an increase of 0.1. On the Canadian employment report, we're expecting job gains of around about 14,500, down from the previous of 222 and obviously we have non-farm payrolls. If we just get rid of that manufacturing payrolls number, stick the unemployment rate in there, with, then we can display the, the high impact announcements along the right hand side. So we've looked at the dollar index. So there is really a neckline resistance around about 94.20. So even if we get a spike through that, given the gains that we've already seen this week, I would be very surprised if we see significant move further higher in the US dollar as we head towards the weekend. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is there's still an awful lot of what I would call uncertainty going around with respect to geopolitics. Donald Trump made some comments at a dinner with his military top brass um, last night that, um, that there could be an unexpected announcement over the weekend, calm before the storm. Maybe he's going to um, pull out of the Iran not a nuclear deal, or maybe he could be planning something with respect to North Korea hard to say um, but at the moment what we're seeing for me this is pretty much a dollar story for this week and um, you know with respect with respect to, to what I'm what I'm looking at at the moment I'm suggesting that if we do get a move higher in the dollar today particularly against euro dollar I think it could well be limited um, it could be fairly limited certainly we're looking at the euro dollar here and the key support here which is similar to the resistance on the on the dollar index is around about 116.70. We haven't quite got to there yet, but certainly this triple top that I outlined here suggests that we still have further upside to run in the US dollar, but I just don't think we're going to see it today. We could well see it over the course of the next few weeks. Now I'm being asked at the moment if I'm still using the old platform. Now I'm still using the new next generation existing platform. Um, same platform that I've been using for the past two to three years. Um, so, um, so hopefully that answers your question. So with respect to this particular number, good support around about 116.70. I think we will see euro dollar lower over the course of the next few days and weeks. I just don't think we'll see um, a significant lower low today. That's probably going to come back and buy me. But certainly I think if we're looking at euro dollar. We need to see a break below 116.70 to argue for a move down towards 115.75, which I think we will see, just just not this just not this week, um, and certainly I don't think in, in light of the, these particular payrolls numbers. With respect to dollar yen, um, looking at dollar yen in particular, that's going to be a key barometer of where we are at the moment. There's a nice little little bit of a flag formation forming here, or a little pennant, or a little triangle. Top of that pennant's around about 113.20. So if we get a breakthrough 113.20, then we're looking to retest the highs that we saw in July. Looking a little bit overbought at the moment. Um, so certainly, I think if if we do see further upside, um, I think we could struggle around about 113.20, 113.30. Um, probably see a drift back down to around about 112.70, 112.30. I certainly think a US December rate rise in answer to a question is pretty much priced in. Um, I think markets are thinking by and large that that is what we're going to get and I think it will be a significant surprise if we didn't. If we look at yields on the US two year, 
we can see US two-year yields are their highest levels um, for five years. If we look at this chart here, we can see that. Um, so you can pretty much see that they're at 1.5%. So I would argue that on the basis of uh, this particular chart here, we're pretty much back at levels um, that we saw back in 2012. If we also look at the weight, the, the rate rise probabilities, uh, world interest rate expectations, at the moment we're looking at 77%, nearly 77% possibility. Market is pricing in 77% probability as near as near as rounding it up that we'll see a December rate rise. So I think the key question now is not whether or not we'll get a December rate rise, is how many we get in 2000. And 18, and that's not immediately clear because ultimately Stanley Fisher will be leaving the Fed this month. Janet Yellen may not even be in charge of the Fed come January, and Donald Trump needs to fill five um, positions on the Fed board. So we don't really know what the nature of the what the makeup of the Fed will be, and ultimately we still have the unresolved issue of the debt ceiling, um, which has as yet not been resolved and won't be resolved until that December or just prior. To that December meeting. So that could be um, a little factor that could derail any potential Fed rate rise. Let's look at cable. We've seen a significant move lower over the back of the over the back of the past, past few weeks. We're on a significant decline, looking towards very key trend line support at the moment, around about the 100 day moving average. There's certainly, I think, a risk premium in terms of sterling weakness because of the political uncertainty and the absolute shambles of the Conservative Party conference um, earlier this week. But I can't help thinking that we've probably seen the, the worst of the sterling move in the short term. That's not to say that we can't fall a little bit lower. There's certainly scope for us to fall back to around about 129.50, 129.70. But if we look at the weekly performance on the pound, we can see that much more markedly here. We're still in an uptrend, and we've been in the uptrend for most of this year. So we've certainly got potential for further weakness. Uh, and the fact that we've fallen towards 130.60 is a little bit of a worry, but that is a, that is quite a key support area in the overall move since the March lows of earlier this year. And again, we are looking a little bit oversold going into the weekend. And ultimately, I'm not convinced that Theresa May um, will be ousted um, before the end of the year. Ultimately, this is a little bit of what I would call... Um, self-indulgence on the part of Conservative MPs. Um, really, I don't think they, you know, I, th there is no upside in getting rid of the Prime Minister at the moment, none whatsoever. Who are you going to put in her place? Um, Boris Johnson, really? Philip Hammond? Not really, I don't think so. There is no credible candidate that, um, you know, can step into her shoes at the moment. Ultimately, if the Brexit talks go bad, they still need a scapegoat. So I think she will stay in place. And an awful lot of what we're hearing at the moment is an awful lot of hot air from dissatisfied backbenchers, which means that ahead of a potential rate hike by the end of this year, and I still think we're on course for one, we'll probably see the pound rebound. But that's not to say that it won't be a rocky ride in the short to medium term. So I think for me, um, this, this, this number is probably not going to tell us any more than we already know. The December rate hike is already priced in. The dollar has had a very, very good week. And ultimately, I think that further dollar upside is probably from here going to be fairly limited in the short to medium term. Certainly with respect to stock markets, we're near the top of the range, I think, with respect to the FTSE 100. Um, can we go a little bit higher? Yes, we can. We probably can come back to around about 75, 40, 75, 50. But again, I think if the pound rebounds, that will weigh down on the FTSE 100. With respect to the S&P, I think whether or not it's a good or a bad number makes no odds. Um, it's still, I think, very much a buy the dip. But certainly, I think in terms of where we are at the moment, I think it's probably going to be a little bit, um, a little bit toppy. And I think the dollar is probably going to be a little bit toppy. Uh, and certainly, if if you know, if you had to push me one way or the other, I'd probably be looking to pare down any dollar long positions ahead of this payrolls number. So we're counting down to the number now. As I say, a disappointing number would not be unexpected. So here we go. Wow, that's a really negative number. <laughs> but um, 
the, the revision, there's been a revision of 169k, and the unemployment rates dropped to 4.2%, 0.5 average earnings, so poor headline number, but a very good average earnings number. So I think markets are probably going to react to the average earnings numbers, as I suspect yet they probably will, and um, we're probably going to see a little bit of a push higher in the short to medium term on the US dollar on the back of that number. Canada adds 10,000 jobs, slightly below expectations. Let's have a quicker look at the dollar CAD for our Canadian for our Canadian clients. My mistake, I should have looked at that before I did anything else. We are starting to approach um, significantly overbought territory on that. And certainly if we look at this particular chart here, um, if we look at this downtrend line here, we've been in a significant move higher on dollar CAD, but you have to argue that we're probably nearing a short-term top in that particular number, and we, we we could potentially start to drift back as we approach as we as we approach the highs that we saw at the at the end of August. Looking at the initial reaction with respect to the FTSE 100, pretty much muted, not really not really affecting an awful lot until we get some clearer indication of where the dollar is going to go. The market's going to want to push the dollar higher. I think. That's pretty much a done deal, but I think, really, despite the fact those wages numbers are good, I think they're going to, I think they're going to struggle to push it much higher. Certainly, I would be looking to pare down any dollar long positions that I've got at this point in time. Looking at the gold price at the moment, again a little bit of a drift lower. That's still looking soft. There's certainly potential for us to go a little bit lower and to, towards this trend line support from the lows that we've seen again you know, a nice little uptrend in place here but the potential for a little bit of weakness probably back towards these lows that we saw at the beginning of august but overall i think um, uh, there's probably a, there's probably less upside towards around about 1290 and a drift back down to around about 1260 1255 over the course of, of the next over, over the course of the next few days um, moving on to Aussie dollar, let's have a quick look at that, some of the key levels there. Um, again, very big support coming in around about this series of highs through here. So we can draw that in there. So around about 77.40. Why, why is that significant? Because ultimately it was, it was a significant resistance level on the way up. So it's going to take something really significant to push it below, which again sort of buys into the story that maybe the dollar is a little bit overbought and probably due a little bit of profit taking. Being asked to have a quick look at the DAX, um, that's certainly looking to test the 13,000 level. Um, but but again, that I think that really depends on what euro dollar does over the course of, of the next over, over the course of the next few um, next few hours. Again, we've seen a very very positive week for the German DAX, but once again, what I want to see here is um, a close above 12,940. I think we could well see that. There's certainly, there's certainly potential for further gains in the DAX, and it certainly ties in with my view of a lower euro over the course of the next few weeks, um, and my target for euro dollar of 115.50. But certainly, I think with respect to euro dollar, I'd be looking to sell rallies at this point in time. I certainly wouldn't be looking to sell it at these particular levels simply because of where it where it currently is, you know, at the lows of the last uh, at the lows of the last few weeks. I'm very much very much a trend trader when it comes to the euro dollar, and I like prefer to sell into a downtrend, and uh, not sell at the bottom of a wave, but sell into a pullback. And at the moment, I think we are very very susceptible to a little bit of a pullback on euro dollar back above 117.20, 117.30 over the course of the next few hours. Looking at the Kiwi, um, let's move on to that. Um, Kiwi dollar, broken below the 200 day moving average. On a technical basis, that's likely to probably go a little bit further. But again, I think I would be looking to trade the pullback on that um, uh, to around about 71 and a half, 72 for a, for a, for a continued move lower there. I think there'll be a little bit of round number support as we approach the 70 level. Um, so uh, that brings us on to crude oil. 
Now, crude oil is quite interesting because we've seen a significant decline in uh, crude oil prices over the course of the past few days, and I think the prospect is we're probably going to, the likelihood is we're probably going to see some more. Why do I say that? Because we've seen a very interesting pattern play out on the weekly chart, and we can see it here. Now, this in technical analysis parlance is what we call a greystone doji. Why is it called that? Because ultimately, it's 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 the gravestone of the bull market. We can see a technical definition of it here. Uh, as I say, it's quite useful as a warning sign that maybe we've seen a short-term top. So, gravestone doji. It's a calling market tops. It marks the graves of the bulls that have lost the day. Particularly good. And we can see we can see it here. You know, basically, this is a good example. Uh, the bulls have lost control and the bears are starting to reassert themselves. So let me just pull that out of the way. We can see that here. We've tried to push significantly higher. We haven't been able to do it. And now, depending on where we close today, if we close below $56 a barrel, then I think the probability is we'll see a move lower in crude oil prices. And I think this is the big conundrum at the moment with respect to the inflationary picture for the US economy. If you look at the ISM numbers that we saw earlier this week, the inflation picture for prices paid is at a five-year high. Yet if you look at the Fed's preferred inflation measure, which is PCE, it's at a two-year low, you know, 1.3, 1 1.4%. 1 so something is not quite right in terms of the trickle-down effect of where prices are going. Ultimately, it doesn't change the picture that we're potentially going to get a Fed rate rise in December. The big question is, where do we go after that? Just been asked to look at Canada Yen, so I'm going to look at that for you and give you an indication as to where I think that is going. Certainly in the context of this particular move here, we are starting to trade a little bit sideways from the highs that we saw in September. Let's drill that down even further, and we can start to do a little bit of analysis on it. So here we go. So draw this one there. Nice little bit of resistance all the way through here. Certainly think that Canada has probably got potential to probably move back towards 9047 but overall I think we've, we've potentially seen the top in Canada yen look to sell a rally back to about 94 9047 91 we're starting to go higher on the slow stochastic so that's so probably being long with a stop loss below this series of lows through here is probably the what the right way to go around about 8960 so Look to really buy the dips on that, I think, Canada, yeah. Right, cable. Being asked to look at cable. I think this 100-day moving average is probably going to be quite important. Certainly, I think 130.30, 130.40, I think, is a decent area of support. We saw it was a decent area of resistance through May and June here. Let me make the chart a little bit bigger for you. So looking at this this area here between 130.30 and 130.40, we saw a peak there, we saw a peak there, we saw a series of peaks through there. So I think if we drop below 130.20, then we're probably going to head back towards this trend line support here. But if we can find support around about 130.20, 130.30, then I think we can see a move back towards around about 131, 131.20, 130.30. So certainly in terms of the pound, um, I think there's potential for a rebound from around about the 130, 20, 130, 30 area. If I if I was looking if I was looking at the cable chart. So hopefully that answers your overall question with respect to the pound against the dollar. Let's just get rid of these numbers here. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, dollar index in the longer term. Well. That's, you know, it's a fairly, that's a fairly decent question. Ultimately, for me, the dollar index is directly predicated on that resistance area at 94.20. So that was the inverse head and shoulders that I was talking about earlier. I did post a chart on Twitter earlier today. And for me, in the longer term, I think the dollar index has got potential to go higher. But for today, I think we've probably really seen the highs in the dollar. We'll probably come back, um, re retest. 
retest, retest the lows on the dollar index. So if we look at the chart that I was looking at earlier on this chart here, we're probably going to come back down from the highs that we saw. So 94.20 is there. We see 94.10 the high. So we, we can potentially come back down to around about 93.80. It really depends on what euro dollar does. We weren't able to break that 116.70 area. We may have another go at that. Um, but ultimately, I think as long as the, the, the euro dollar is able to hold above 116.70, 116.65, the dollar index should drift back. But over the longer term, I would expect the dollar index to push higher, complete that inverse head and shoulders, and, 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 and head higher. So hopefully that answers your question. Longer term, I think it goes higher, just not today. The thing about preempting inverse head and shoulders breakouts is they have a habit of coming back and biting you, and that's why I was that's why I articulated my concern about selling euro dollar on a break below 116.70, 116.65, because this you could argue is a head and shoulders reversal here. We saw the triple top here. This is the left shoulder here. This is the head here. It's an irregular head, and we've got a very lazy right shoulder here which I don't think has really been given an opportunity to complete. So I think if we get a rebound of 116.70, then we can get a pullback to 118.30, and then we can potentially head lower from there. But at the moment, I think the range trade for euro dollar is 118.30, 116.70, and, so, and look to sell the rallies on that. And by definition, that should cap the dollar index, but in the short term. But in the longer term, I think the dollar index... Can, can go higher, just not today. Um, hopefully that answers your question and I don't have to re-answer it at, uh, later today if the dollar index does break higher. But ultimately, you know, no one's right all the time. That's why we have stop losses. That's why we implement risk management. Uh, and ultimately, if the dollar index does break higher, then you're looking to put a stop loss at around about 94.30, 94.40. If, if you're a dollar breaks lower, then your stop loss needs to be around about 116.40, 116.50 if, you, if you're looking for a little bit of a rebound on euro dollar. Um, Germany 30, quite happy to look at the Germany 30. Again, as I said, I mean, that I think is going to be a direct correlation with euro dollar. If euro dollar breaks lower, then the Germany 30 will continue to head higher. If we get a rebound in euro dollar and it heads back towards 118, then that, I think that will put downward pressure. On, on the DAX and at the moment I struggle to see it above 13,000 today. I really don't I, don't, I don't think the momentum is there. I don't think you really want to see, um, I don't think you, I don't think you're going to see um, investors wanting to stay long over a weekend. North Korea still remains a clear and present danger. We don't know what's going to happen over the weekend with President Trump and pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. So I think if you're looking to I would be very, very cautious about being overly long equity markets going into the weekend. It's a natural caution born of the fact that you will have no control over where they open up on Monday morning. So I think it does pay to be very cautious in that regard. So the euro affects the Germany 30. Absolutely it does. If you actually look at what the DAX has done since um, the euro topped out at 120, um, we've, if we look at a daily chart here, ladies and gentlemen, we can see it. When the euro was at 120, let me just pull that there, there's, there's the DAX. Okay, if we look at euro 120, it's not an exact correlation. Okay, so you need to be careful about extrapolating a direct correlation. But if you look at, if you look at where euro dollar topped out around about August, September, and where the DAX bottomed out on August and September, when euro started to drift lower, the DAX started to go up. So, and the reason for that is that a stronger euro means that German exporters are much less profitable because ultimately a weaker currency boosts your export capability when you convert it back into local currency. So exporters want a weak currency. That's why everyone was um, so not too bothered about a weaker pound because ultimately it boosts your export capability. Same applies to German exporters. A weaker euro, good for German exporters, increase profits. So you look at euro, do you look at euro dollar, and you look at the German DAX, and there is a little bit of a correlation with respect to um, the way that they 
correlate with each other. It's not a direct correlation, but certainly in the short term, it does work quite well. Um, with respect to the Dow Jones, um, we have, again, new record highs every day, and we can probably continue to carry on doing that. I think we'll probably struggle to make a, a new high in the short term, but certainly I think there's no reason to suppose we won't continue to do them next week. Um, in the medium term, I think probably what we'll see today is a little bit of a sideways consolidation in the same way that we saw um, head on Wednesday, um, simply because, again, caution ahead of the weekend, a little bit of profit taking, taking some money off the table. It's a new week next week. We've got the latest Fed minutes. We've got US CPI. We've got US retail sales. Um, CPI generally has been a little bit on the weaker side. What I will be looking for next week, though, ladies and gentlemen, is some evidence that the strong prices paid numbers that we've been seeing out of the ISM numbers start to manifest themselves in the CPI, the headline CPI numbers. We've certainly seen it in respect of wages today. What we want to see it now is in terms of headline inflation. At the moment, we're not seeing that, but certainly I think that wages numbers that we saw, that wage number that we saw 15 or 20 minutes ago does appear to suggest that wages are now starting to exert upward pressure on inflation. And that is a good thing. That's a good thing for the US economy. It's more spending power for the US consumer. And ultimately, it will mean that the Fed has more flexibility to raise interest rates over and above the quarter of the cent that's being priced in already for the end of this year. OK, so that's it for this week. Got one other thing to say. We do have a Monday webinar with my colleague David Madden. You can sign up for that on the um, uh, website. It starts at 12.15 and he'll give a preview of the week ahead. Other things to watch out for next week is the start of bank earnings season, US banks, third quarter earnings. Now, we've heard an awful lot of concern that maybe trading revenues might be a little bit weaker. So watch out for that because I think if you look at US banks, I think they are priced uh, quite nicely. So if they come in and disappoint, we could see a little bit of a drift lower. Having said that, banks like higher rates and certainly higher bond yields are certainly going to improve their profitability. So, you know, talk, talk of tax reform, talk of higher rates, you know, all generally positive for US banks. But ultimately, we do need to be prepared for the fact that they might be a little bit disappointing on the revenue side when they report next week. We've also got China trade data, um, giving us an indication of how well the Chinese economy is doing ahead of the plenum, the, the Congress, which starts on the 18th of October. So we may see some indications as to how the Chinese economy is doing, whether or not the exports are starting to slow down as a result of a stronger Chinese economy. There is some evidence that Chinese exports were slowing at the same time as internal consumption was actually starting to pick up. So keep, it, keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and obviously Catalonia. Catalonia going to be, could be a potential clear and present danger for European equity markets and by definition for the euro as well. So I think that could be another factor that could well limit the, the upside in euro dollar. Again, look to sell rallies on that back towards the 118 level if we see them. So that's it for today and this month, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for your feedback. And until the November payrolls or the October payrolls in November, I'd like to thank you very much for listening and um, wish you all a very good weekend.